Uh, it's a busy, busy time for everybody here. Um, I'm learning from my panelists that it's particularly busy for, for them as they, uh, we didn't necessarily have everything in order, but I think we now have a, a general lay of the land for this session. Um, we're going to try to be as efficient as possible because we have an enormous amount of expertise on the panel uh, brought into this conversation and we want to give uh, as much of a chance as possible. Um, I think that as with the session that I think we're following in this room, this is one of the topics that I think is of greatest interest uh, within the IGF this year and within uh, the, the world community that's looking at these issues generally. So as you know, we're looking at tackling violent extremism online and looking at in particular the human rights challenges for states and business in that regard. My name is Peggy Hicks. I work at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, we, of course, are, are very interested in looking at this interface between human rights and digital space. One of the, I've just returned from Silicon Valley in the past couple of days, and one of the things that we're really looking at is how we can make sure that some of the expertise, ideas, and frameworks that have been developed in the human rights area are usable and transmittable within the digital space, you know, that we don't necessarily create a whole new ethical approach that, that doesn't necessarily draw on and build from the human rights frameworks and the great work that's been done, for example, by my colleague I see sitting there, Michael Wiener, on, on hate speech and, and relationship in the Rabat Plan of Action, for example. So, but we won't have time to, to go into all of that this afternoon. Um, what we'll try to do is, is allow each of our panelists here to speak and, and give, give their inputs for about four or five minutes. I'll try to keep uh, to time on that, and then we'll open it up for questions from all of you and then return to the, the panel at the end for, for some uh, uh, concluding remarks. So I, I'd like to first give the floor to the gentleman on my left who I probably doesn't need much introduction in, in these circles. He's done so much incredible work in reporting on, uh, on these issues of human rights and protection of uh, the right to freedom of opinion and expression, but in particular, of course, he, he's uh, done incredible work sort of focusing on the role of, of tech companies in the digital space as well. So we're very glad to have uh, David Kay, the UN Special Rapporteur, uh, with us. And I just wanted to ask you, David, for you to give us your sense of some of the greatest challenges that uh, we see in human rights in addressing violent extremism online and what are the trends or what are the positive possibilities that you see in that space? Thanks, David. Okay. Thank you, Peggy, and thanks to Tim, for wherever Tim went, for organizing this panel. Hi, Tim. Um, so um, I just want to make a few general points. This is a really amazing panel, and there's so many of you here, so I feel like in other panels we haven't always left enough time for discussion. So I'll just make a couple of points. Uh, trying to answer this very small question that Peggy has, has asked. What are, the, what are the challenges? So I want to say a couple of things. So the first thing is, um, is a generic problem about uh, the term extremism. A and I think this is important. This, this extends beyond the online space, right? It's, it's a question about, it's really a question about rule of law. And I think a core problem for dealing with uh, with how we restrict, if that's what we want to do, extremism, putting aside the violent uh, part of the of the question, is what is extremism, right? How do we define extremism? And there aren't that many definitions, if any, of extremism either in national laws or in international human rights law around the world. And so that that's a problem for public governance. Right? It's a problem for, uh, for individuals who need to know what, what law, what the lines are, whether there are any lines at all between what is legitimate expression and what, is, uh, what may be criminalized. Um, and it's a problem in particular for online platforms because online platforms are often being told you need to restrict uh, extremist expression. But it's hard for them to do it if they don't have definitions uh, about what those, what those specific, what the term might mean. Related to that is a, a very real problem, again, in public law, which is the redefinition of everything as extremism, 
right? So, um, I, and I won't even, I'm not going to give any examples because you probably, everybody here may have three or four examples in their heads, right, about journalism being redefined as terrorism um, or uh, minority expression, particularly minority religious expression, being defined as extremism. I mean, there are just too many examples to go through here. So there's a fundamental problem about the use of the term uh, extremism, which is a problem of public policy and it's a problem of platforms. Okay, so that's, that's the, the one sort of generic point that I wanted to make. And then the second, and then I'll end with, with the second point. And, and if you want sort of the footnote to all this, um, my colleagues in the OSCE, uh, the Inter-American System and the African System for human, uh, uh, human Rights Protection, we all issued a joint declaration uh, on the issue of extremism and freedom of expression in May of 2016. So if you just Google joint declaration, and I guess I just gave a, um, gave a commercial for <laughs> Google, but it's, it's a small g word. Um, if you just look up <laughs> a joint declaration and extremism, then, then you'll find it. Uh, and we go through these, these different principles. I think one of the major uh, problems right now for online space is essentially governments, on the one hand, um, kind of hijacking terms of service and, um, and making demands for takedown of content that they'll call extremist, um, that they might find a kind of wedge in the, in the terms of service that work for them to make the takedown call, um, but they're doing so when they themselves could not restrict that expression as a matter of human rights law or as a matter of domestic law. And related to this problem is that we don't have much information about how many terms of service takedowns are being requested. Um, so, uh, and, and we don't have a real good sense, I think, of how much is being requested by government, how much is being requested by individuals, because, of course, a lot of the platform regulation is decentralized right now. It's, it's um, you know, uh, sort of flagging that individuals can, can adopt in order to, uh, um, to restrict or uh, at least get expression that they disagree with investigated, uh, maybe to get people's accounts suspended on different platforms. So I think these things are, are obviously connected. Um, and if we think about them only as problems of the platforms, we're going to miss a whole bigger problem, which is these are problems of public policy. There are major, major problems of rule of law around the world that are um, global because they're problems in Western democratic countries and they're problems in repressive countries around the world. Um, and these are not problems that are only solvable to the extent they're solvable by the platforms uh, themselves. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Peggy, and uh, thank you to your office for putting together this great panel. It's a privilege to be a part of it and to share a panel with you again, of course. Um, I, I wish I could show you the slide that illustrates my example. I'm sorry, David, you decided to let everyone imagine their examples, but I'm going to interfere <laughs> with your imaginings and give you one. So, uh, so there's, a, there's a hard case in India that I like to talk about in the context of extremism because there's two sides to this, right? One is the redefining of uh, content that is obviously not extremist content as extremism. And then the other sort of the hard case problem is uh, when there is extremism that takes place, but it's wrapped up with important political expression. 
Um, and so if you think of, um, of any movement, the Irish struggle, you know, any movement that, that, that a state might call uh, seceding, uh, but that the residents of, of, of a particular region might call a legitimate political demand, you'll see that, it, this, that the speech connected to that, that movement ranges from political arguments, which are protected speech, to what you might call incitement to violence. And so we've got our Kashmir, which is uh, a hotbed for this kind of expression. And um, a major uh, social media platform got into a lot of trouble recently uh, because there was, a, uh, there was this gentleman called Burhan Bani that was killed in, in Kashmir. And there was a lot of content that went online related, uh, related to, the, to the killing, but also related to Burhan Bani himself. Um, so the slides that I was going to show you is one is just a picture. It's the cover of Kashmir Inc. with Burhan Wani's face on it. I'm sure that if you search, you'll, you'll see it on image search. It's just literally his face, and it, there's the word Kashmir underneath. Um, that, that was taken off the platform. And then there was a, another one that's of Burhan Wani looking like basically a teenage, a, a teenage boy, like lying in the grass looking at his mobile phone, and there's a... The, it's like heart saying Burhan. And apparently that was taken off as well. Um, academics that, that said that, um, that this is something that Kashmiri people care about found their accounts blocked. Um, so it, it, it was one of those cases in which there was a mass block that resulted in response to the fact that, that this had a relationship to extremism, but valuable political speech was censored. It's just something I like to describe to people so that you can understand. So using the same platforms and the same services. So what Yes, we have faced the same challenges that uh, you've raised in terms of uh, having to create a balance between bringing down content, network surveillance, and the right to privacy and the uh, freedom of expression. However, we have to be honest with ourselves. With rights, there are responsibilities. And I think it's very easy for us as end users, as an end user, to go out there and say you have a right for freedom of expression, you have a right for uh, to privacy, but those rights are valid insofar as they are not infringing on the rights of others who are also using the same platforms and the same services. So what we've done in Kenya, we have a National uh, Integration and Cohesion Act under which we address issues of hate speech, under which we address issues of uh, conflict and conflict resolutions and, and all these. And so during the August uh, elections that uh, took place this year, there were incidences and uh, we'd already issued, we've, as a result of that act, we have got guidelines on how social media platforms should be used. We've got guidelines on how content should be handled and what kind of content should be accessible across different uh, channels and what time. So there's, there are very clear rules and guidelines that need to be followed by the different service providers and the end users. So uh, when it comes now to an issue where we've got extreme content, and the reason we've done this is because we are, we, of our proximity to Somali, we have had uh, Al-Shabaab attacks range, uh, increase from a situation where we had them once in six months. We now have them every week. Every week there's a bomb somewhere. Every week there's a uh, kidnapping. Every week there is ransom for uh, people kidnapped, people hijacked, and all that kind of stuff. So our environment has forced us to change as a business entity. When you sit at your desk, you're wondering, 
whether you as the CEO will be the next target. Will your child be taken, uh, will, be, will your child be hijacked by Al-Shabaab for them to demand a ransom from you? That has forced the government and the private sector to work differently. And so we collaborate. We collaborate as an industry association, as Tess spoke, with the National Security Intelligence Services, with the military uh, intelligence services. We share information on what we see online. We've had very good partnerships with uh, platforms such as Facebook and Twitter that have worked very closely with us over the, the period of time we've had them on board. And during the elections, we were actually able to go and target individual entities and have them off. We just removed individuals offline because their right for expression was creating a problem for everybody else's right to use the platforms and to feel free and safe. And if you're going to use the internet to plan how you're going to set up bombs and how you're going to bring down populations and buildings, and we sit there as the business people running this infrastructure, owning this infrastructure, and knowing that our own families are at risk, we have to think differently. And we are forced by our environment to think differently. So yes, you have rights. To use the infrastructure in Kenya, to use the internet in Kenya, it's accessible, you have a right to communicate, you have a right to use it. But use it in a responsible manner so that your rights do not infringe on the rights of everybody else. All of us can drive. Anywhere in the world you can drive. You have a right to drive, you know how to drive. But that doesn't mean you drive over the pavements, you drive in the fields, you drive everywhere. Why do we respect that? Why can't we do the same online? We should be able to handle the online space in the same way that we handle our normal physical space. Yes, I have a right to walk, but does that mean that I'm going to walk over the tables and get out of this room because I have a right to walk? If I did that, you will definitely throw me out and you'll say she's crazy. That is what we have discussed, we have looked at, and so we have laws and regulations that govern those rights so that we can have an appropriate balance between the rights to privacy and the rights to freedom of expression. Because if we don't have that, if we advocate for rights only, then we'll find ourselves in a situation where we are pushing for the rights, but nobody is taking responsibilities for how those rights are abused. And I think that is what puts us in situations where we find a lot of extreme content. And what we've done is we've been able to get support from most of the content managers. And yeah, we deal with Al-Shabaab, we get them online and we deal with them as individuals because technically it's possible for us to track you on your MAC address, your IP address, and to know where you are and what you're doing. And for mobile operators, we use the SIM card, the SIM card registration, and once we've got uh, an indication from the security agents that they want to investigate, we have procedures on how that is communicated, we are able to uh, give them access. And we keep track, we actually keep track of how many of those cases come in at any period in time. So we've tried to, we are maybe a unique environment or our circumstances have forced us to try and address the whole issue a bit differently because if we sleep on the job, it will be my daughter, my husband, my sister, my mother, my father who will be blown up. Thank you. It's, it's very important for us to hear the perspective of, of that direct engagement for the, the very real and physical reasons that you've talked about. I think you've also obviously hit on many of the same issues that have been brought up uh, about both the, um, the, the point about the, what's, what happens in the physical space has to be carried over online. I think part of the issue and what we have to break down is, is how you do that effectively um, and, and who's doing it. And it's interesting to hear in particular how it works in Kenya, who's responsible, and I think some of the key questions we'd like to get back to are on that breakdown of responsibility between government and content uh, providers. So with that, we will turn to uh, the big, uh, big G Google uh, representative on the panel. We're very glad to have with us Alexandra Walden, uh, who leads Google's work on free expression and human rights on the internet, international policy team and she represents Google on the Global Network Initiative and in other uh, multilateral fora for dealing with controversial content. So please, Alex. All right, I'm on. 
Um, so much has come up with the folks before me. I feel like what I really want to do is give a quick overview of how, what our approach is to controversial content, but I know folks are interested to kind of engage more and there have been so many questions. So I'll just cover that and I recognize that much will come up in the, in the discussion portion. Um, so I think it's important to talk about, about scale to give a little bit of context to what we're talking about, at least as the way um, YouTube and Google are dealing with these issues. For YouTube, there are one billion people who come to the platform every day. And I know many of you already have heard this, but there are 400 hours of content uploaded every minute. And so when you think about that, that means that we have to be creative about the ways we are making sure that, um, that we are maintaining the policies about the type of platform that we, that we seek to maintain. So we value openness. We are a company committed to free expression values um, and to access to information, but it's not anything goes on our platform. We have a set of community guidelines, our content policies, that govern the rules of the road. Those are publicly available to all users. And to be clear, most users come to our platform to do you know, sort of perfectly legitimate things, to look at beauty vlogs or look at cute animals, um, to, to like watch sports. Um, and it's also become a place where people watch the news and learn about what's happening around the world in places that previously were inaccessible. Um, so all of that openness uh, and the ability for new others to tell stories and for the democratization of storytelling are all the benefits of the open platform that we maintain. But that openness comes with challenges. Um, and an important piece of that is figuring out how to deal with exploitation of our platform. Um, and so we've done a number of things, especially when we're talking about terrorist content and hate content, um, we've done a number of things over the course of the last year to make sure that we, and to demonstrate how we are being responsible and drawing responsible lines for dealing with these issues. Um, so I guess I'll, what I'll do is just sort of highlight some things quickly. Um, you know, one of the important things for us is that we work collaborati collaboratively across the industry. One of the ways we do that is through the Go Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. And another important way that we do that is through the Global Network Initiative. And that's a multi-stakeholder space where companies, uh, civil society, investors, um, and academics come together to talk about the challenges of free expression and privacy vis-a-vis uh, -vis government. Uh, so, you know, there are multiple ways in which we're collaborating to make sure that uh, that we're getting the best input because we recognize that we don't have all of the answers. Um, another, another piece that I wanted to flag here because it's come up across the panel um, is about transparency um, and also Brett's question about how much of the, how much of this, um, of how much of our content is really, you know, this hate and violent extremism and terrorist content. We released a number last year that less than 1% of the content that we remove is for violent extremist uh, and hateful content. So again, when you think about the scale, billions of hours, or billions of users, hundreds of hours every minute, um, and less than 1% of that um, is in these categories of content. But it's really important for us to be responsible in the way that we deal with these categories of content because uh, we're dealing with a set of highly motivated stakeholders, right? Or not stakeholders, but a set of highly motivated actors. Um, and so we have to be smart about the way that we are, that we're approaching the problem. One of the ways we do that is through a trusted flagger program. We work with NGOs all around the world that are experts in hate and terrorism and anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, et cetera, all of, all of these things. Um, and those folks are able to flag content in bulk for us. And, and the purpose of that is not um, that we're using them to flag at scale, but what we're doing is using that information to help us train our classifiers so that when we're using machine learning to identify this kind of, this kind of terrorist content or this kind of hateful content eventually, uh, when we're using machine learning for that, we're training our classifiers on the kind of content that, uh, that's being flagged by experts across all of these fields. Um, so we really do rely on partnership with experts across all of, the, all of those fields. Um, I guess the last piece I want to hit on as it relates to transparency is that we, you know, we recognize that it's important for the community to understand what is, we have a transparency report already, I'll say, um, and that what that does cover is government requests. 
and that's something that we set out to do years ago and we've improved upon that process. Um, sort of every iteration, there's a little bit more, a little bit more context about the kinds of things governments are requesting. Um, but as we move into more and more uh, conversations about how we do content moderation, we recognize that the world is interested in how we do that. And so we have committed in 2018 to being more transparent about what the flagging process looks like, what in the aggregate those numbers are. Um, so I just wanted to make sure folks are aware that that is something we recognize uh, people are interested in and we are committed to doing more. Um, so I'll stop there, I know there's a lot. Not a lot of time and a lot of questions. You, you also came in exactly at five minutes. So <laughs> very impressive. Um, thank you. I think that was a really amazing range of, of views on, on an incredibly difficult topic and one that giving people five minutes to speak on is, is really unfair because I'm sure uh, to even touch the surface of the issues takes longer. Um, but we'll ask the same of all of you. Um, I will have a, a few minutes here for you all to come in with questions or comments. Um, if I could ask people to identify themselves when speaking and try to keep your comments as brief as possible so that we can have as many questions uh, from, from all of you as, as we can fit in. So I will take any comments all the way in the back. Yes, uh, D David Ardos from Cambridge University. We've had this conversation about transparency which has come up in a lot of the sessions. And I was wondering if uh, the panelists could reflect on how to create the right sense of transparency because on the one hand I think many citizens feel that they should be able to rely on reasonable local law to complain about content and on the other hand some platforms then provide no accountability at all as to what action they take on that maybe they're taking off a lot of content whereas others would tend to through maybe the Lumen database and I'm not going to name names here but publish the name of the person that maybe even their physical address in some cases, and the, the URL even if it's removed, say if it's against a search engine, which could be quite chilling on the privacy and the integrity of that individual. So can we come up with global standards as to what is appropriate transparency and what is uh, needed and what is actually a threat to the very uh, uh, reporting which we would tend to think was necessary? Great, thanks very much. I'll take a couple of questions and pull them together, please. Hi, I'm uh, Rikke Frank Jørgensen from the Danish Human Rights Institute. I'm still struggling to understand the scope of the, of the um, responsibility to protect uh, with regard to private companies, the responsibility to protect human rights, and in, in particular related to freedom of expression. So is it a freedom of expression issue if a private platform informs or enforce their terms of service without any government interference? So they enforce their terms of service on a daily basis. As part of that process, they take down content that is legal after national law, but there is no government involvement. Is that a freedom of expression issue under international human rights law? I'm still struggling to, with that question. Very glad to say we have somebody who I think knows the answer and has written extensively on it next to me. So we'll, we'll give him a chance, but we'll take one more question first, please. All right, uh, Alp Toker from Turkey Blocks. Uh, so my question is actually, it, it follows on from the previous one. Uh, we know that uh, governments uh, file blocking orders and Lumen makes some effort to collect those, uh, but a lot of blocks are instigated by individuals, people. Uh, is there a opportunity to add more of these to transparency reports? I think this is a question for Ms. Walden, but also for um, uh, Mr. Gay or anyone else who wants to comment. I think it's, it's a nice group because they're all connected, so I'll come back to the panel and we'll try to have one more round. Um, since I mentioned on the human rights law question, I, I feel comfortable uh, deferring to David on that, and then I'll give the, the rest of the panel a chance to jump in. Okay. You Rika, you should write a book on it. She is. So I, so the, um, I think, I mean, obviously it's a great question and in, in a way it's, it's, it's not the question, but maybe a couple of thoughts um, because I think we're all struggling because I don't, I don't have a, the answer, I don't think. But um, first is, 
Um, I'd like to refer to Article 19 of the ICCPR first, which says everyone enjoys the right to freedom of expression. Uh, and, and I like that because it's, it's been understood by both the Human Rights Committee and as freedom of expression has been interpreted by other bodies as meaning that, um, that individuals have the right and that certainly if we're talking, now I know you talked about the absence of government, but if we're talking about government, that government also has a responsibility, I think, to protect that right to freedom of expression. So that's, for me, sort of a first point is that it's written, the, the terms of human rights law are about the individual's right to express. And so I think Brett used the, the phrase um, rights respecting um, or something like that when, in his intervention. And I think that to the extent that, that companies interfere with that freedom of expression, then I think um, that's, that it could be understood as a, as a problem of human rights law and that companies, just like other third parties, have the responsibility to protect other rights, that companies have that responsibility too. Now, one of the problems, I think, is that it, if, we, if we lived in an environment where there were uh, a huge number of competitive platforms, then you might be able to say, well, this platform is, um, you know, um, is, is more restrictive of expression, but this one is not. And so you can move from platform to platform and still have the same reach, let's say, in terms of your expression. I think that gets harder in spaces that are dominated by, say, one or maybe two platforms. And so if you look at a place like Myanmar, for example, you know, a lot of public expression, at least in, in Yangon and Mandalay, the, the, the cities, um, is dominated by, by one company, basically. And so that company, that platform, has kind of provided the public space. And I think thinking that through as um, a kind of, the, the company as a kind of quasi-public actor may be different from how we think about it in a place where there are multiple platforms. I, I'm just throwing out some ideas. I'm not totally answering your question, but, but I do think that that we can think about companies as standing in a position of responsibility to, um, to protect individual rights as they're defined in, in human rights law. Uh, and there just may be variation from place to place, but generally speaking, I think they, they do have that responsibility. Thanks, David. I, um, on the two transparency-related questions, I, you closed with that issue. Alex, do you want to come in on it? And others on the panel, just let me signal me if you want to come in. Sure, I can, um, just as it relates to blocking, I think, you know, we do on our transparency report include information about service disruptions. A lot of the time those are not for us, for YouTube, for our hosted content platforms. When our services are turned off, it's not, we are not always um, notified. And so oftentimes we are, you know, we get notice from someone in the community that says, we don't, you know, we don't have access to YouTube and then we'll see a news hit that it's been turned off in a place. And so we are not actually always the first to find out um, that services have been turned off or that there's blocking happening. Um, but to the extent possible, we always um, include that information as part of our transparency report, um, both links to news articles um, and, you know, sort of we, you can see a, a location in the transparency report that tracks sort of the service generally. Um, and so we do our best to make sure that as much of that information as possible to, uh, is accessible to users. Sorry, Alex, but I, I feel like some, somebody made this point and it's a, it's a valid one, which is why I wanted to say that it's something that I worry about as well, which is that I haven't seen a transparency report that um, that flags enforcement of terms and conditions and the kind of blocking and take takedowns that take place in that context. Um, I, I wanted to add specifically that, uh, especially when it's a trusted flaggers mechanism, mm -hmm. um, I, I think that many of us wonder what would happen if a trusted flagger over flags. Um, is, is there a place in which we free that space? Yeah, so that was the, the, what I mentioned was that we are committed to it. We don't currently include in our transparency report information about our policy removals. In 2018, we do plan to include information about more of our flagging and removal. So it is not something that's currently there, but it is something that we are in the process of developing and figuring out how we are going to be more transparent about that. Um, on Trusted Flagger, the way that the program works is that 
participants must have high rates of accuracy in flagging to participate. So if there is a participant that is flagging and not flagging accurately, then they would not remain in the program. Yeah, uh, on the transparency issue, um, so transparency reports have been began, I think, in 2010 or 2011, largely by Google, um, which is great. And I think we've started to see now an industry trend towards transparency reporting, um, largely in terms of like requests from law enforcement. But there are obviously many other factors here in terms of content removal. Um, Access Now has issued um, the Transparency Reporting Index, which has all of the, or not all of it, but many of the reports, the transparency reports that have come out um, from companies. So we have all of them in one place, which you can small g Google um, to find the place for them. But the thing that, I, as I mentioned before, there is a lack of consistency. So we don't actually have a sense, unless we like add all of those transparency reports together, um, we don't have a sense of, of and even then, um, of the level of, remo of removal. Um, and then on the flip side, we don't have transparency reports from governments. So we have them from some companies. So we actually need two sides of it. And I'll just say one last thing on transparency. I think transparency is the easiest thing that a company can do, like in terms of human rights compliance. It's the easiest thing. There are many other things that they need to do on top of that. But the transparency thing is a, is a first step. And I will give credit to, to Google for initiating that trend uh, and that norm across the industry. Uh, anything you want to add about the Kenyan experience in terms of transparency relating to sort of the, the actions that you were talking about maybe in the elections context or elsewhere? Well, uh, for Kenya, the data from government in terms of um, their requests to have either content brought down or to have individuals off the net is there. It's, um, I think part of it is covered in the Communication Authority report. And if not, there is, under the Communication Authority, we have the, the national Cyber Security Command Center where we liars with the different security agencies. And so at that level, we do have a report at, that I need to check whether it's available online or not, but there is a report that normally we share with uh, the, the, the service providers. And then every service provider sometimes gets their own other private requests from law enforcement. So they keep track of those. And w uh, I don't have the, the details of the letters, but we, we are able to provide a report on how many requests came in and for what kind of investigations. And yeah, we can be able to share those. Just real quick, just on that, like, um, you know, with all due respect, I, I understand the sort of the complexity of the situation in Kenya and in many other countries, but the points that you mentioned in terms of the process is, and with, with respect to transparency, is like it's opaque. And I think that the Kenyan community in the same way as other national uh, populations deserve, and it's the obligation of the state, I think, to provide that information in terms of what sort of content, what is the definition of extremist content for your purposes? Um, what is the process of identification of that content? How is it stored? How is it collected? How is it communicated, uh, even post facto, to the person whose content has been removed? Which members of the Kenyan government have it? Is it just, is it the national security agencies? Is it the, is it the military? Is it the civilian? I mean, all of these questions, and I understand the complexity, as I say, in terms of protecting populations. That's absolutely an essential thing, and I also respect the thoughtfulness of it. But the, if we're just talking about transparency, there is a real lack in every jurisdiction of information, vital information about these processes, and also, and again, the benefits of, of doing so in terms of protecting populations and the state. If I can just respond to that. These, the, the time, the five minutes was too short to be able to give details, but in the guidelines, there's a very clear procedure of who can ask for that information. And then we do have a national and integration commission. And those are the people who for now handle all uh, the issues. So we, everything is channeled because it's run under that act. So everything is channeled through there with the exceptions of uh, external terror related issues that are handled through the Ministry of Defense. So everything else, head speech, goes through there and, and uh, there's a court process. So there's the whole process of going through uh, legal uh, processes to be able to defend yourself, so to say. And, but the, the guidelines on what content 
is not allowed on social media has, has been public published in the newspapers and every Kenyan known for example knows for example you don't circulate uh, pictures if you're found on WhatsApp or Twitter or Facebook with photos of dead people and their faces are visible of uh, you, you know basically scenes from an explosive yeah it's not allowed because it it makes others very so the, the guidelines are very clear and there's a whole list of images that are not acceptable and also uh, communication that is not acceptable and that was in the daily papers for every Kenyan to access Thank you. I'm sure we could uh, have a full additional conversation on that. I think one thing that's interesting is the extent to which states, you know, are, are needing to jump into this space um, and, and companies as well and are, are, you know, sometimes jumping further and faster than perhaps we have everything that, that we need to do, but understandable for the reasons that you've said, but, um, but trying to find a way to, to, to both continually improve and to take some of the, the comments and the practices that are being developed as we go forward because the, both the threats and the measures to address those threats are evolving continuously. So it's a, it's a particularly difficult regulatory environment, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We have one question back here. So a gentleman's been trying to come in and then you in front and that'll be it, I think. Thanks, um, Richard Wingford from Global Partners Digital. My, my question relates to algorithms. And I can understand, given this issue of scale and the pressure from governments, that many platforms are turning to users for the use of algorithms or automated processes to identify and take down content. Um, but my question is, given the limitations, particularly in terms of struggling to find a definition of violent extremism, the uh, biases that can exist, and, and the lack of transparency in algorithmic processes, is using them at all a rights-respecting response to the issue of violent extremism? Or is there a way, if not, that safeguards can be added to make them rights respecting. Thank you, Catherine Dittal from Kenya. I have two very short questions, points of curiosity. Uh, one is um, how uh, do the different jurisdictions handle the issue of multilingual content, especially that which is uh, framed in a very subtle way uh, where the translation is not obvious. And the second point is where does the deleted content go? Uh, I think it's two days ago when there was an accident in, uh, was it in Manchester or Birmingham, somewhere in the UK. And uh, I heard an announcement on the news that uh, people should not share the images of the accident uh, out of concern for the families but could they please share them with the police to assist them with their forensic investigation? So I'm just wondering whether there are any policies around uh, where the content, which is perhaps not suitable for public consumption, uh, goes to assist in other things, such as research or forensic investigation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had two other people who wanted to come in. Um, we're almost at time. If, if you promise to limit it as short a question as you possibly can, I'll let both of you do so, please. Well, yeah, thank you. My name is Niels Lestrade. I work for the Dutch National Police, and I'm <coughs> sorry, also responsible for the unit that does the content uh, reporting. Um, I really like the list of questions that Brad Solomon shared with us, and these are also questions that we have to deal with on a daily basis. Uh, we don't have answers to all the questions, and it's an ongoing process, and we try to find the best way of implementing, um, well, our task, the task that we have been given. Um, but there's one th thing that I'd like to, 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 to add already, and that's about the criteria, because indeed, uh, terms of service, these are quite problematic to us as law enforcers. So uh, I think it's good to know that uh, at least how we did it in the Netherlands is that Terms of service don't really, uh, they're not important to us. We only refer content if, if we think, and this is important because we are not judges, but if we think that these are violations of democratically defined uh, rules. So it needs to be, and there's a, a high bar even in this, so it needs to be either incitement to violence or recruitment to, uh, to, uh, to weaponry. And these are the, this is the type of content that we report. Um, and if, it, uh, well, I think I, I'll leave it uh, to this for, for now. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to make you go so quickly. Please. 
Thank you, Mugambi Nandi from uh, the Communications Authority in Kenya. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to give two quick clarifications on um, something Fiona mentioned. Um, and uh, by way of clarifying on the issue of uh, uh, terrorism, I think we need to make a distinction between uh, content that is uh, supportive of uh, terrorism and content that um, has political implications, national political implications. So like if you read about our elections, there's a lot of tribalism and things like that. So in terms of terrorism, the government does have a cyber security center that does that. But for the other content uh, that is, if I could say more benign, not terrorism, but still extremist in, the, ex ex extremist in the sense that it creates divisions, that's a tribalism and uh, religious and all of that. That is dealt with by a, a different independent constitutional commission, um, just to clarify that. Yeah. Thanks, that's, that's very helpful. I told my panelists I'd give them each a minute at the end to, to close, and it will have to also bring in any responses to the questions that were raised, including the one on algorithms the, the comment from our colleague from the Netherlands and from, from Kenya, uh, two comments there. Uh, so please, I'll, maybe I'll go in reverse order if that's okay and start with Alex. All right, um, I will use my minute wisely. Um, when it comes to rights respecting use of algorithms, so for us we use machine learning to help us identify content. We don't automatically remove content. For us there will always be the need for humans to be part of the process. It's a mix of humans and machines that will get us to um, sort of operationalize these, these issues at scale. Um, and that's an important, that's just an important flag for the way we talk about use of machine learning. Um, when it comes to multilingual content, we have reviewers uh, both on this, the side that is government requests and then on our policy review end. Across the board, we have lawyers and reviewers that can review content in a variety of languages around the world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and that's not to say, of course, we make mistakes sometimes. And when we do make mistakes, we have an appeals process on YouTube and we often reinstate content uh, once we're flagged, uh, once there's an appeal and once we're on notice that, um, that there may be an issue, we have a process uh, and we do reinstate content when we realize we've made an error. Um, and finally, I would be remiss uh, if, I, if I didn't flag that counter speech is a very critical part of the way our company sees addressing issues of broadly hate and extremism and xenophobia and terrorism online. Uh, we have invested millions of dollars in campaigns to help uh, YouTubers uh, better use the platform to amplify their messages to push back against these narratives. We've done that in addition to investing in NGOs that do innovative work in this space um, that are seeking to use the online world to push back against these narratives and create other ways to tell stories. Um, so I just wanna flag that as another way we really rely on freedom of expression um, and users uh, using their voice to push back against some of the problematic things that we see come up online. Um, and then just finally, you know, as, as you've seen across the panel, these are complex issues without simple answers, and we recognize that we don't have all of them, and so we are very committed to continued dialogue in multi-stakeholder settings to help all of the players really like address and problem solve around these issues. I'm going to borrow from the last comment and expand it to suit my own purposes. Um, I have uh, three things to say. W one is, I know most of you know this, but I just want to emphasize that uh, merging terrorism and law, law and order problems happens a lot. Um, and it's something that we should guard against because there is an increasing trend towards the securitization of the state that relates to many of the things that Brett described. So that's one. Two is that when the trend, uh, w when the move actually takes place, the national security bubble is an opaque one traditionally, and that creates the space for a lot of um, censorship of speech without any explanation. This is the kind of thing that even the Indian Supreme Court has accepted in its privacy judgment, saying that national security is an exception, but not um, defining clearly what a proportionate approach to national security would be. So that's something that we need to push back on if we want to make sure that human rights are protected in the context of online extremism. The last one, it sounds silly, but it's a serious problem. I'm just going to leave you with an image of the ways in which um, 
ex the extremist narrative can be abused. In India, we've got this uh, this phrase that I laughed a lot at, but it's actually really dangerous. It's uh, love jihad, which is essentially the phrase that they use for interreligious marriage when one of the parties is Muslim. Uh, but this this is something that has actually been seen as a legitimate act of terrorism. It's being taken seriously by the Supreme Court that has actually investigated the case of a marriage like this. And so I just, I'm, I'm putting this out there just to let you know how far a, uh, an, an extremist, um, how far um, the extremist narrative can stretch um, if, if you let it go out in question. I think at the, um, at the end of the day, it's um, important that we realize we cannot be able to solve uh, human rights issues as respective entities on their own. What has worked for us in Kenya is because of the collaborative effort that we have between private sector, government, and civil society. And we are able to sit down together and to address the challenges and the issues and in drawing the three circles, get the center point where these circles overlap and focus on that. There's a lot we're still not able to solve, but the fact that we've got this center that is agreeable has enabled us create regulations, we, we uh, create uh, laws to fill the gaps in our laws and regulations to support those laws and to be able to appropriately act and keep our online environment as safe as we can and also keep our physical environment safe. And I think for me, that's uh, what I would give everyone as a takeaway to go with. And, and uh, as we move along, because the technical environment is always changing, we will change as the sh circles shift. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so um, my key takeaway, I think, is where I started is that uh, that censorship and surveillance regimes are currently being built and they are almost impossible to dismantle. I know that because uh, in the US context, it's taken, I think, 25 years to get one amendment in one piece of legislation uh, to, like, slightly wind back the capacity of the, uh, of the NSA. So they're almost impossible to dismantle, and that's basically what's being created now, infrastructure, but in the context of what's going to come biometric databases, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, where everything is connected. And so I think that in establishing these frameworks, including private body of law and privatised enforcement, with mission creep in the context of unclear definitions, will result and is resulting in the name of fighting terrorism, um, an adverse and irreparable uh, um, impact on, our, on all of our rights, and not just the right to freedom of expression and privacy. Uh, so two quick points. So one is uh, on the Netherlands, kudos. I mean, it'd be nice if all states uh, approached these issues from a democratic accountability perspective, but unfortunately they don't. And, and I, so I actually went, wanted to just make a quick note about, you know, we've been talking about platform regulation mainly, uh, almost exclusively, but one of the real big problems, particularly in the extremism space, is network shutdowns altogether. This isn't obviously a Dutch problem, but you know, in many, many places around the world, um, whether it's extremism or incidents of terrorism lead to total network shutdowns. And so I don't want us to, to forget that and to also remember that even in a, in a, at a time when, um, when it's so clear that private actors are involved in regulating content, um, governments are still the, the major threat to freedom of expression around the world, at least in, in most parts of the world. And then the second qu point, just on, on algorithms and whether, um, whether we can have, um, whether algorithmic rules, whether automation can be rights respecting. I think the p one point here is that governments increasingly see automation as uh, the sort of the, the solution to everything. So this isn't really just a question of what the platforms are doing, because I think as Alex suggested, there has to be some automation when you've got the scale that these companies are working on. They've also got human engagement, which as Sarah Roberts has mentioned at a couple of panels, and you should look at her writing, you know, presents some real key problems for individuals who are doing that, that moderation. So I think that um, it's not a question of whether it can be 
rights respecting, it can be. And so the question is, I think for us, as we're all thinking about al algorithmic transparency and regulation is, what are the inputs? It's not just about the code, it's about what are the human inputs that go into that and how transparent is that process so that we can actually have a, a debate where we have equal information as companies and governments do about um, what actually is, is feeding into those, um, those uh, automated tools. Thanks, David. I, I promised we'd try to cram a lot of uh, information into a one-hour session. I think we've succeeded in doing that. Um, just three quick points for me. One is just to pick up on the issues that, that I think Brad and, and others have raised quite clearly, that you know, from a, a UN Human Rights Office standpoint, one of the key issues here is that if, if we don't get this right, if, if we allow sort of vague notions of extremism and, and overbroad policies and approaches, to, to shape how we do this. We know what has happened in the space in the physical world, and it will happen in the digital world, and it will happen better, stronger, faster in terms of going after everybody who's in opposition and everybody who, um, you know, the content, I think Jemaya's examples, Jemaya's examples are, are instructive to all of us about how broad and how scary it can get quite quickly if, if we don't try to regulate and have a, a real understanding of how we're going to address some of these challenges. So I think it's our marching orders are set very clearly by the discussion today. Uh, my other point, I wanted to mention, David's got the copy of this report that um, Mike Posner worked on at uh, NYU with the uh, World Economic Forum. If we're gonna give shout outs, is there somebody here who worked on it back there? Yes. Um, thank you for this. Uh, I think it's a good description of some of the issues in this space. I, I read it recently myself. so. Uh, um, I, I do think there's a lot of great work being done on, on how to break these things down. And then finally, I'll just close by, by of course, thanking our wonderful panelists and also acknowledging the, the wonderful team, Tim and Azim, who have helped us pull the panel together today and all my other colleagues that are in the room who have been working on these issues and trying to, to bring us together to talk about this uh, as we go forward. So thank you all very much. Because it, 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 it was so cool with your words, you know. I hope they don't go away. Wait, it, the background is just kind of, it's kind of creepy. I mean, that's, how did they spell Saki? They, they didn't say it, it didn't come in. <laughs> Um, there was it was before you hit the, I think it's because someone said, oh, I got to go, yeah.